Hey, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Five Forks uh, Sunrise Service 2020. We'd be, like to begin with uh, singing a song with you. We hope that you're singing in your living room or wherever it is that you're watching, and we're going to sing Low in the Grave He Lay. morning and it certainly is a privilege to remember and think about that first Easter sunrise and then also what it means for us today. I think it was a warm sunny day when I agreed to speak here at the sunrise service this morning. I had no idea it was going to be this cold but I uh, hope you don't mind I'll keep my hands in my pockets most of the time. I mean, it was uh, 31 years ago on a Sunday morning and it was the morning after we had buried our fourth son at Macha in Zambia. And we couldn't believe that something like that had happened in our happy and growing family. Because up to that point, it seemed God had always spared us such heartache. But that Sunday morning, we were awakened by a song playing on the stereo. And the song was titled, Then Came the Morning. And I'd like to share some of the lyrics with you. They all walked away nothing to say. They had just lost their dearest friend. All that he said, now he was dead. And so this was the way it would end. The dreams they had dreamed were not what they seemed. Now that he was dead and gone, the garden, the jail, the hammer, the nail. How could a night be so long? But then came the morning. Night turned into day, the stone was rolled away, and hope rose with the dawn. Shadows vanished before the sun. Death had lost, and life had won, for morning had come. What a change in perspective for us. You see, that song, those words, brought such hope 
to a grieving family. And the words of the song were inspired by another story, a story that we recall, and I'd like to read it, part of it with you from Mark chapter 15 and 16. Some soldiers nailed Jesus to a cross, and it was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. Later, Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And when the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he exclaimed, this man truly was the Son of God. Some women were there, watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, and many other women were also there. This all happened on Friday. Well, the officer confirmed that Jesus was dead, and so Pilate told Joseph that he could have the body. And then Joseph took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in the cloth, and laid it in a tomb. And then he rolled a stone in front of the entrance, and the women saw where Jesus' body was laid. On Saturday evening, the women went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. And very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. And on the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. And when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in, white, in a white robe sitting on the right side, and the women were shocked. But the angel said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples. And so they rushed back to tell everyone else what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, and so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and he saw the empty linen wrappings, and then he went home again, wondering what had happened. There's another story in the book of Ezekiel, and the Spirit of God takes the prophet to a place where the remains of the dead are strewn about. And God commands Ezekiel to preach to them. And then he, when he does, the bones become covered with flesh and are resurrected. So these two stories, Ezekiel's vision and the story those women told, I believe may be the answer to one of the most important questions that we can ask, especially in a time like we're in right now. What will God do in the face of seemingly almost insurmountable obstacles? Or to put it another way, what will God do in a world that's surrounded by death? Well, to quote Esau Macaulay, the entire globe is convulsing with death and illness and economic collapse. COVID-19 has taken the lives of too many. And a certain dread lingers as we wait for the virus to make its way increasingly into our communities. There's not much for us to do, but take the advice of the professionals. Pray for and give to those in need. Refresh our news and our social media feeds and wait for test results, along with our friends, our family members, and our neighbors. What a somber season. But this morning, we've begun to turn the corner toward Easter. And so dare we say more, dare we speak of joy and resurrection in a world that feels like it's in the shadow of death? Well, if the prophets of the Old Testament and the gospel writers of the New Testament have anything to teach us, it's precisely that in the darkest moments of our history, we need divinely inspired and freshly articulated hope. You see, Ezekiel lived with people who had experienced deep trauma and had lost loved ones. And their future hung in the balance, it seemed. And much of Ezekiel is a lament over Israel's sin, but the book also contains passages that look to God's future restoration after the season of trial and death is over. And of course, the most famous of these passages is where those dry bones come back to life. But I believe that the point of the story is plain enough. Just as it seemed impossible 
that dead things could be resurrected, it also seemed impossible for Israel to be restored. But we learn that God did fulfill his promise to the Israelites and they were restored. And friends, every Sunday morning, and particularly on Easter Sunday morning, we recall the story that reminds us that God brings dead things to life. Because Jesus came back to life, every one of us can have the hope of new life, resurrection with Jesus. We as Christians know that the dry bones vision isn't just a metaphor. God's faithfulness does indeed call dead things to life. The Israelites knew that God's ability to save them had no limits, no matter how dire their situation was. In fact, it seemed that the deeper the problem, the greater the glory of God's redemptive work. And so for Ezekiel, deep human suffering collided with God's promises. And the result was a vision for the future. Dry bones coming to life. And I hope that vision remains with us today. For Jesus' disciples, those women and men who had traveled with him, they had hung on his every word. They had witnessed his miracles. They saw him raise dead people to life. They heard his promise to them of abundant life and constant companionship. But he had died on a cross. And he was buried in a cave in the rocks. And his promises collided with their experience, with their pain, and their dashed hopes. But all of that changed on Sunday morning. When the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty because Jesus had risen from the dead. You see, it seems then that right in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic is precisely the time to speak about hope. Hope that's rooted in God's promises. Hope rooted in the truth that Jesus, the Son of God, very dead on a Friday evening, was very much alive the next Sunday morning. You see, he arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Friends, these promises are not about the American economy and they're not about our jobs. God has made no guarantees in that regard. He's also not guaranteed that all of us will survive. In fact, we will not. What then has he promised? Well, God promised that not even the gates of hell will prevail over God's church. I don't know what the future of Christianity holds in the weeks and the months to come, but I do know, however, that the church will not be overcome by a virus. I know this is not the end, and I know that we will, in fact, worship together again. But is it possible to say even more? Is it possible to say, like Ezekiel, that the intense pain of this season can lead to a grander vision for a reinvigorated people of God? Is it possible to say that at the end of all this, we won't simply resume our work and go on as usual, but rather expand and grow the church with fresh confidence in God's providence. I'm anxious to see what kind of church emerges from this trial, and I pray that it will be glorious. You see, this hope for a transformed and revived church is crucial, but the more central promise for Christians is that, is that God defeats death. Think about Jesus' words in the upper room on Thursday night. They came during a dark time in the lives of his disciples. He knew that the time for his suffering and death drew near and that things would get worse before they got better. He told them, you will weep and mourn. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. He wasn't promising that they wouldn't weep and mourn. He was promising joy on the other side of their mourning. And so today we can sing with joy. Then came the morning, night turned into day, the stone was rolled away and hope rose with the dawn. Shadows vanished before the sun. Death had lost and life had won, for morning had come. What's the source of our coming joy? It's Jesus' own resurrection. What is it that gives hope to the church in the midst of a pandemic? It's the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting. It's God's promise written in the blood of his son that he loves us with a love that's stronger than death and that at the last he'll call us from the grave to see him, to be his friend, 
no longer his enemy. The celebration of Easter tells us what lies on the other side of COVID-19 and on the other side of all of our trials. Friends, it's life with God. And I believe this message is necessary, not because we're stumbling towards Easter Sunday with only six of us gathering for a sunrise service and only seven or eight of us gathering for an Easter worship service. We're not a scattered and beleaguered people of God, but it's necessary because the truth of the gospel shines most brightly in dark times. You see, John wrote in his gospel, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it this Easter. It doesn't matter if we can't be together in our building. We can still shout as one people, Hallelujah! Christ is risen! And I believe God hears our triumphant cries, no matter how hampered they are by the fears of unemployment, sickness, and even death. Satan and the powers of evil also hear, and they tremble. You see, even if we're confined to our homes, the gospel remains free and continues to do its work. Nothing, not even a pandemic, can change that because Jesus conquered death, the last enemy of our souls. And so we will proceed with hope, hope in a risen and living Lord, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, you are love, you are light, you are wisdom, you are hope, you are life. And as the sun rises this morning, filling the earth with light, may the risen Christ fill each of us with the light of your gospel, the good news of salvation. May Holy Spirit fill us, fill us with wisdom to face each uncertain day as they unfold before us. Fill us with a hope that does not falter even in the midst of difficult circumstances. Fill us with your love to the point that it overflows to hurting and lonely and broken people around us. Fill us, Father, with your life, eternal life, made possible through the death and resurrection of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
right, before you go, we'd like to keep up one more tradition. We want to ring the bell for you here this morning at our sunrise service.